Good morning, SCC. Um, I'm Grace. And I'm Jared. And today we're doing the call to worship from Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and 2, 9 to 10. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. For in him the full the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Touch the hearts of all. 
My friends, at this time of the year, especially, Advent tells us about hope. Hope that we are not alone. Sometimes it feels as if we can't see God, but God is here. At Advent, He was on His way to us. Often the best way to remember His presence is through the faces and the stories of others. I'm Miranda Newman. I am married to Jason Newman. I've got three kids, Sawyer, Miles, and Heidi. When I was 16, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. I don't talk about her very much. I had just turned 18 when she passed away. She had ovarian cancer for a few years. It kind of came out of nowhere. It progressed quite quickly. She, she hung on for a couple years for us and my siblings and my dad. I remember watching her take her last breath and thinking, what on earth, like, why would a God who loves me do this? I was never so angry, I was never so hurt or annoyed or confused as to why God would take a young mom and leave her whole family behind, but knowing that she was at a place in her heart where she knew that she could let go of her family and go to God was really amazing and just knowing that she had so much faith in Him that she could take that step into heaven. severely burned and she was airlifted to the hospital. She suffered 27% of her body with second and third degree burns and then she got a secondary infection. I was baking brownies for dessert and I turned around to turn the oven off 
and as I was turning my back to her, she grabbed my coffee off the counter. She just climbed the cupboards and grabbed it and then it fell all over her. So. I was home alone with the kids. Jason was out of service, so I couldn't call my husband for help. And my van was in the shop, so I couldn't go anywhere. I pulled her dress off and I tried to kind of wash her off, but there was coffee grinds everywhere. So I remember feeling like I needed to scream, but I couldn't because I had three kids watching me. The ambulance came and initially I was really mad at them because they didn't know how to handle it. They didn't have pain medication for her right away and she was clearly in shock. We were airlifted to Kelowna and somehow we got there. I didn't know how to calm her down. I just remember that I needed to stay really calm. So I just sang worship songs from home in the ambulance and in the helicopter. And I remember a lot of people telling me that they heard me and I have a terrible voice, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but it kept her calm. I wasn't able to hold her well and comfort her. Yeah, we had a lot of people praying for us, a lot of people reaching out to us. And I had a friend come out of her way just to come see us and it was during COVID, so that was pretty special. The day she got her infection, her heart rate started to fluctuate. And I remember just watching the numbers go up and down and her fever creep up and she wouldn't eat, she wouldn't nurse. And I remember being really mad because I thought I finally have a daughter and now God's going to take her away and she's only one. So I remember being very mad and crying out to God and asking him why and why now and why her and why us. After two weeks of treatment that she got for her infection, we got to go home with our daughter. We really felt the power of prayer. Um, God really healed her. Every time we changed her bandages, we could see the evidence of his love and his grace on her. All the stars bow down, hear the angels sing. Hallelujah, Jesus Christ is born unto us this day. I wished it had never happened, both losing my mom and my daughter getting hurt, but I'm thankful it did because it brought me to where I am now. I know that even though our stories can be shattered and broken and messy, that he brings us to his feet at the end of the day and one day we'll know why and one day we'll know how and we'll see all his reasoning behind it when we're at his feet. Good morning, SCC. It is a privilege to be able to be speaking here today on this second day of Advent. Ben asked me about a month ago if I'd be willing to speak uh, here in Salmon Arm, and uh, it is a privilege to be able to do so. Um, just when you think you've done everything in your life and uh, you've seen it all and heard it all, all of a sudden something pops up and jolts you into reality, and here I am speaking to, I thought it was going to be a red dot, but it's a green dot, but I'm grateful that Sam is here as well to be able to have at least one person in the congregation to speak to. I've been asked to speak on love, the second uh, subject of Advent. Uh, this is a strange season this year, so different than any other that I've been involved with. No big gatherings, no Christmas train, no Stanley Park train, no elaborate Christmas productions, 
No trees in the church. So many things, no Sunday school concert. And yet in the midst of what we have lost and the sadness that we feel, there's one thing that does not change. And that's the story of Christmas and the story of love. Because Christmas is all about love. The carol that was chosen for us to listen to today, I had never heard before, but I listened to it about 20 times since I, uh, Jordan gave it to me. Jordan said, I found it hard to find a carol that spoke of love. It's interesting that uh, there's carols about the angels, there's char- carols about the shepherds, there's carols about joy, there's carols about peace. But there's very few carols that really focus on love. It almost seems as though love has been pushed into the background at Christmas and all these others have been brought to the forefront. But the carol that uh, Jordan has chosen actually was released in 2008 in Portland, Oregon at a church called Generation Unleashed. Uh, The carol says, Come all ye people, see the love, see the grace. Come all ye broken, see the love, see the hope that restores everything that has been lost. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Let's look at the love that restores that which has been lost. Christmas carols may exclude the word love, and yet really love is the heart of Christmas. But what do we mean when we say love? Uh, The word love today has been used so indiscriminately, one wonders exactly what is love. Uh, I'm told that my dog loves purina dog chow. How does a dog love purina dog chow? We're told that we will love this vehicle. How do you love a vehicle? Uh, Some people will say, have a piece of this cake. I know you will love it. And my response to them so often is, I love my wife, but I'm sure I'm going to enjoy the chocolate cake. So what is love? There are basically three words in the Greek that are used most often for the word love. One is eros. Uh, And eros actually means a, a sexual erotic love. And God never allowed that word ever to appear in scripture. It's used in Greek poetry, it's used in Greek literature, but never in the scriptures. The two most common words that are used for love in scripture are phileo and agape. Phileo is a fondness, a a friendship, uh, this kind of love. Agape is a love that loves unconditionally. So when we think of the term love in the scriptural form, and when it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that word agape is used. And the word agape says he loves the world unconditionally, without reserve. The other interesting thing when it says, for God so loved the world, the word world in that sense, cosmos in the Greek, actually refers to something that is messed up, something that is broken, something that does not have any beauty. And yet the scripture says that God loved the world. J.B. Phillips wrote an article or a little book, and he described what this world cosmos means and what it means for the love of God to look upon the world. And he writes a a story, it's a a fable, and he says, once upon a time a very young angel was being shown around the splendors and glories of the universe by a senior and experienced angel. To tell the truth, the little angel was beginning to be tired and kind of bored with what he had seen because he had looked at so much of the glamour and the wonder and the beauty and the spectacular of the galaxies. And finally, the senior angel said to him, I want you to look down at that little planet there. The senior angel pointed to a small and rather insignificant sphere turning very slowly on its axis. It looked as dull as a dirty tennis ball to the little angel. His mind was filled with the size and the glory and the splendor of the galaxies, but this did not interest him. 
the senior angel said to him, I want you to watch that one particularly, he said the senior angel. And the little angel said, well, it looks so small, rather dirty to me. What's so special about that one? And the senior angel said, that is the visited planet. And the little angel said, you don't mean visited by and the senior angel said, yes, which I have no doubt looks to you very small and significant, but not to the one who visited the Prince of Glory. The little angel said, but how? How do you mean that our great and glorious prince with all his wonders and the splendor of his creation and millions more that I haven't even seen yet come down in person to a fifth-rate little planet? Why should he do such a thing? The senior angel said, it isn't for us to question his whys, except that I must point out to you that he is not impressed by size and numbers, as you seem to be. But that he really went, I know, and all of us in heaven know as well. As to why he became one of them, how else do you suppose could he visit them? The little angel's face wrinkled, rather in disgust. disgust. Do you mean to tell me he stooped down so low as to become one of those creeping, crawling creatures of that floating ball? I do, said the senior, senior angel. And don't think that he would like you to call them creeping, crawling creatures in that tone of voice. For strange as it may seem, he loved them, went down to visit them, to lift them up, to become like him. And the little angel looked blank. Such a thought was beyond his comprehension. So pause. Think about that. God, creator of the universe, the splendor of the galaxies, chose to come down to a little insignificant planet called Earth, to this world, because he loved it. God's love for us is seen in that he sent his son, Jesus, to be born in a manger so that he could save us from our sin. In John 17, in the high priestly prayer, when Jesus is praying for his own, we read that Jesus said, you love them even as you have loved me. In this high priestly prayer, there are three things I want us to ponder about his love. This incredible statement is hard to fathom. I, I hope you picked it up. He said that you have loved them even as you have loved me. Did you catch it? You have loved them even as you have loved me. The word even, or in some translation it is as, actually is the Greek word kathos. And it means to the same degree as, at the same level of, the same amount of. God loves the world to the same degree that he loves his son. What incredible love. He loves you as much as he loves his son. He loves me as much as he loves his son. So what is this love? How can we describe this love? Uh, I'm going to try and do it using three words. First of all, that his love is limitless. It has no end. There is no limit to his love, to his son, nor to us. We have limits in ourselves, and we may think or pretend that we don't have limits, but all of us have limits. But in regards to God's love, it is limitless. Um, my wife and I live out at Sunnybury Bible Camp and Miller College. And uh, sometimes I like to pretend that I still have en endless and limitless energy. 
I go out and play frisbee football. I play basketball. I play floor hockey with the students and dodgeball, and I love it. Um, I, I think sometimes they just tolerate me and allow me to come in and play uh, and possibly also placate me. But uh, on one occasion, one student last year said to me, you know, you're actually pretty good for your old age. And I thought, uh, if he had stopped that, you're pretty good. That, you know, I would have felt really quite good. But when he added, added for your age, I... Now, what really is he saying? Should I really be playing with these kids? These young people? We have limits. We have limits to our energy. We have limits to our wisdom. We have limits to our mental capacity. We have limits in our life. But with the Father, there is no limit. There is no limit to his supply of compassion. There is no limit to his supply of comfort. There is no limit to his supply of hope. There is no limit to his supply of peace. There is no limit to his supply of grace. And there is no limit to his supply of love. Jesus came to the earth he took on flesh. He laid his glory aside to become one like us. What a cost. God becoming man. There is no greater example of love than God the Father sending his son to earth to become one of us. But not only is his love limitless, his love is also endless. And there's a difference between the two. Uh, one is quantitative and the other deals with time. His love is eternal. It never ends. It's like the Niagara Falls and the water coming over them. I don't know if you've seen Niagara Falls, but it never stops. And, and, and God's love will never, ever stop. In Malachi, he said to, to the prophet there, I am the Lord your God, I change not. In Hebrews chapter 13, I read the, the, the author saying, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love for me, his love for you will never change. It's eternal. I love what the hymn writer wrote when he said, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies the parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by tra trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Isn't that staggering? His love is limitless. His love is endless. But his love is also perfect. It is complete. It is, it is full. It is full and overflowing. His love does not take into account our race, our financial status, our looks, our abilities, our accomplishments, our heritage, or anything else. His love to us is perfect and unconditional. Nothing, nothing, Romans says, Paul says in Romans 8, can separate us from that love. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This Christmas story is all about love. 
But the most important part of the story is God's love for you and me. God's love for this world he gave his only son. God's love for us is the very reason that we're beating, our heart is beating. It's the very reason that we are breathing. The good news of God is that he loves us on our good days and he loves us on our bad days. He loves us when we feel his love. He loves us when we can't feel his love. He loves us even when we don't deserve his love. And there is nothing, there is nothing, absolutely nothing that can separate us from his love. If you ever doubt God's love, then look to Jesus, his son that he sent. Look at Jesus, the child that was born in a manger, taking on human flesh. Look at Jesus, the man, teaching the people, preaching the gospel to the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Look to Jesus, the Savior, suffering and dying on the cross for your sins, for mine, so that we might become his children. Look to Jesus, the King, the one who was risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, coming back one day for you and I, or one day for us to go and meet him. The love of God surpasses knowledge. And it is difficult for any of us to grasp the width, the length, the height, and the depth of God's love. Because his love is limitless, endless, and perfect, I know that he has my best interest at heart. In Jeremiah chapter 11, he, the prophet reads, writes, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So, why should I complain when my plans don't go as I think they should? You know, this whole pandemic has thrown us out of our normal rhythm. We can't do what we used to do, just any time go to a restaurant for a meal or go to the store shopping. We can't go where we used to go. Christmas time is going to look very different. I heard this morning that 88% of the people have either canceled what uh, they were going to do at Christmas or going to have changed, already changed their plans. 11% of the people in this province have saying that they're going to have Christmas as usual. The other 1%, I'm not sure. I don't think they've made up their mind yet. So I should not be distraught. I should not be discouraged. I should not be overwhelmed because of the situation that our, our, uh, that the world finds itself in right now. Uh, I, I think this whole pandemic is God's way of saying, mankind, you know what, you're not in control. There's only one who is in control. The one who loves the world that he created. So the best thing that I can do, even through these turbulent times, is to love one another. God so loved the world but in 1 John chapter 4, 7 to 12, he says, This is love, not that we loved God, but he first loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. Notice, God's love comes first. God's love created the world. God's love always comes first, and our love for others must follow. Our love for others must follow not out of obligation, not out of moral responsibility, but out of love because we love Jesus. When I look at this text, I see that our love to others, while God's love is limitless, ours is not, nor will it ever be. But that does not and must not stop us from loving others. God's love for us should touch us in such a way that we want to love others. If the world ever needed love, it needs it now. So many people are challenged. So many people are hurt. So many nerves are frayed. So much anger is being seen and it erupts. We need to understand how others are doing and how they are coping. And just a month ago, I had a funeral 
in Armstrong. And uh, the children's father had been tested for uh, COVID, was placed in a separate room. The only people that saw him the last days of his life were the caregivers, bringing him food, tending to his needs. As I sat with the children at the funeral home, they were still trying to cope with their loss and, and the loss that was intensified because of the distance that was between them and their father. If the world ever needed love, if our neighbors ever needed love, it is now. Our love is limited by God's grace. We can still love. But our love, not only is it limited, our, our love is not perfect. While God's love is perfect, full, and complete, ours is not. So I, I ask you a question. Do you love all your children and grandchildren equally? It'd be nice if there was a congregation here to see the nods and the popes and so on. Do we really love every one of them to the same degree? We might say we do. Uh, this week when I sat down with uh, one of the students at Miller, he said to me, he said, you know, and I didn't even broach the subject. He said, uh, one of my aunts had favorites. She had a favorite niece and she had a favorite nephew and everybody knew it. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would say, yeah, um, I, I, I don't love all of them equally. I, I have to confess, um, I'm one of those. You know, there is one grandson that is more special to me than all the others. And I think it's because when he was born, we were living in the same house. Uh, I was semi-retired. Um, as an infant, he would fall asleep on, on my chest and we'd have afternoon naps together. When, we, when I did things around the house, he was there with me. When we went outside, he would follow me. Uh, one day I was pulling up a swing and a slide for the grandchildren, and uh, he, he was three at the time. It was such a hot day, I took my shirt off, and uh, I went back working, and I turned around, and here he had taken his shirt off. Grandma, Grandpa, and uh, his grandson. Uh, last month we were down to see our, our grandkids and family, and uh, when I, we were leaving, I gave him a hug and a kiss, and I said, see you, Parker. And uh, then we went down the stairs and heading out the door, and somebody said, where's Parker? And uh, our son said, oh, he's wrapped up by the patio doors in the curtains crying because Pa is leaving. Kind of puts a lump in your throat. And we won't even see him this Christmas. I confess that I love him a little bit more than I do others. I love all the others. My love is not perfect. None of us can love perfectly, but that does not excuse us from loving one another. Even those that are a challenge, even those that may be unlovable. Martin Luther King once said, Hatred paralyzes a life. Love releases it. You know, I was so impressed uh, last week when talking to the Fellowship Ministry Center that Dr. Bonnie Henry, they, they're sharing with me that Dr. Bonnie Henry actually has sat down with all the denominational leaders who, would, who were willing to, to talk to them about how can we best manage our way and navigate our way through this pandemic and giving you the religious liberties that, that you need to have. She hasn't just brought down an iron fist. She hasn't worked with this as though uh, I'm in control and you don't have a say. She is trying to her best to work with churches and people and pastors and say, how can we best do this? I, I think it's a sign of love. So how can we respond? I believe we can respond by putting on one of these. 
because I love my fellow neighbor. So what are some examples of this love? Let me share just a few examples of what this love looks like and then how we can love. My mother um, lived with us until she was 100 years old. Then she went into a home and she had requested that uh, she have a private room. Um, there wasn't one available, so she had a roommate, uh, a lady who was in her 60s. My mom was already over 100. Uh, she had, was amputees, both legs. And uh, she became very good friends with this lady, even though not a Christian. They came into her about a year later and said, Mrs. Christensen, there's a, a room has come available. Would you like to have a private uh, room? And she said, no. I, I like my roommate and I want to stay here. Sharing love to one another. Then there was a young lady who had just graduated from Trinity Western University, was in our congregation in Langley. And uh, when she graduated, she said, I, I, I want to really do something for the Lord. And so she went to Cambodia. And uh, there in Cambodia, she was working with a group who brings young girls away from and out of the sex trade, a, a very dangerous place to be involved in a dangerous ministry to be involved with. And I think to myself, here is a young lady who has just graduated from Trinity Western University. She has all her life ahead of her, all the potential, could get a good job, and she has chosen to go to Cambodia and work with young girls. Why does she do it? Because she loves Jesus, and she loves those people. Another young gal in, in Kamloops that, that we know are very good friends with, um, she has her nursing degree and she has said, you know what, I can work at the hospital for two days a week and I can work three days a week at the pregnancy care center. And I thought to myself when I talked to her last weekend, uh, when I talked to her about the hospital, you know what, it, it, they really pay well at, uh, at the hospital. And that was the extent of it. And then you ask her about the pregnancy care center and she said, these young gals need so much help. They need so much encouragement. She said, I love working there with them. And she cares for them. Why? Because she loves Jesus and she loves others. God so loved the world that he gave. And even as he has loved us, so we ought to love one another. So what can we be doing? Uh, last uh, Friday, my wife and I delivered meals to seniors in our community of Tappan. And really, we did it because 55 plus at Sunnybrae, there's a seniors Christmas banquet that takes place. And we were not able to have the banquet because of COVID. So do you know what we did? We decided we would make 400 meals and deliver them to seniors from Kamloops down to Kelowna. And uh, that's what we did last weekend. So one home that my wife and I went to when we gave them the meals, both the, the lady and her husband just cried and said, you have no idea what this means to us. You have no idea. And she began to cry. Loving. We may say, well, it's a pandemic. We can't do anything. Oh, yes, you can. The church here is putting together Christmas hampers. You can bring to the office gift cards, um, food items, and they will distribute them to people in our church in need and people in our communities. There are so many ways in which we can help. Um, there is a good friend of mine, his daughter passed away this summer in August in Turkey, giving her life unto the Lord. I'm thinking to myself, here are people complaining about the pandemic and they can't visit their loved ones. And they won't even see their loved one again, not until glory. We can send a text. We can make a phone call. We can send a card to those who are hurting this time because of loss of loved ones. 
Love builds faith. Love brings hope. Love brings peace. Love brings joy. And so this Christmas is not only a reminder how much God loves us, but how much we need to love one another. Is there someone you need to help this Christmas? Is there someone you need to forgive this Christmas? Is there someone you need to reach out to this Christmas? As the carol said, come all ye people, see the love, see the grace. Come all ye broken, see the love. This is love that Christ loved us and we ought to love one another. And they will know we are Christians by our love. We need to care deeply. We need to love generously. God bless you this Christmas season. Father, thank you again for your word. And again this morning, we are just overwhelmed with the extent of your love toward us. So undeserved, so messed up, broken, and all the rest. And yet you continue to love us even when we are unlovable. I pray your blessing upon this church family. I pray your heavenly father for those who are struggling this time of year that you would give them added grace to uh, help them through this Christmas season. Most of all, our heavenly father, we thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to earth in the flesh, take our sins upon you, and to give us eternal life as we believe in you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Thank you for joining us on this Lord's Day. Um, I'm reading from a book called Peace. Stephen J. Nichols as our benediction for this morning on the second day in Advent. Blessed Lord, who has caused all the Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may be in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. The second Sunday readings remind us of how Christ came in humility to an ordinary place in a stable of animals among an ordinary people. This is a time to remember how Christ fully identifies with humanity in the Incarnation. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she, will, she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. Micah 5, 2 to 5. Thank you again. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.
stars bow down, hear the angels sing, hallelujah, Jesus Christ is born.